introduce uh, Pastor Jan Hurst and his wife Iris are here ministering to us. Um, um, some of you know that I went to school in misery. That's what I, but they actually live in Missouri. <laughs> you, you see what I did? Never mind. Doesn't matter. It's not important. The point is, the point is, <laughs> the point is, um, I, they were referred to us, and I'll tell you what, every conversation I've had with him, I just got warm fuzzies, and I'm not, you know me, I'm not, that's not, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't stand on the mystical, I, I stand on, on trying to be faithful and obedient in the word, but I also know that the Holy Spirit is very much able to do the mystical, and so every conversation I've had just made me feel good. It did. It excited me, especially when you hear um, the, the, the ministry to Muslims, etc. That moves me. That stirs me up. And so I'm excited. Brother, will you come? Uh, this is Pastor Jan Hurst, missionary. And I'm going to let him sort of share more about where he's from. And you can preach from anywhere you want to, but looking forward to it. Amen. Push the button on, yeah. We're not the sharpest missionaries, but, you know, we'll, we get there eventually. So uh, thanks, brother. Um, but, you know, I've just so enjoyed just even this, this early time and in the lobby and all that meeting a lot of you. And uh, there's just a beautiful family spirit here. How many know this is a wonderful church family? And, yeah, you're blessed. You're blessed. You know, that's what church is. That's what the church of Jesus Christ is, is it's family. We, are we have finally come home where we belong. And it's home forever. And this is just a foretaste of what it's going to be forever with family in heaven. Amen? But we want all of the family to come home, don't we? How many know there are a lot of lost brothers and sisters still out there waiting? You know, that elder brother in that parable of the prodigal son you know, instead of him going out and helping find his lost brother, missed the whole point of family. He missed the whole point of sonship. But how many know God wants us to go out? The Father sends us out. And what an honor it is to do that. And so thank you for sending missionaries like us to go out. But you're going out in this community and in this area. And so God has a place for each of us. Amen. But it's just a joy to be with you this morning. And uh, it's a special joy to have uh, my wife Iris with me this morning. Um, I think, baby, could you just stand? Some of you met her. But just so you know who I belong to, this is my home. And uh, when people meet us, they, they're like, they look at me and they look at her and they're like, how did that happen? How did you get hurt? You know, I mean, already, uh, Daryl, I don't know where Daryl is this morning. He met us, and he's, he said, well, she's obviously your better half, you know. And then I met Jimmy, and uh, he said, now, is this your daughter, or who is this, you know. So, so they, they, you know, people just let me know how blessed I am. So, but most importantly is, is the wonderful, godly woman that she is. And um, I, I encourage you to meet her. If you can, she's definitely my better half. My own family likes her more than they like me. So uh, she's just a gift from the Lord to me. And uh, she's a very gifted writer and editor. She's the creative director of our ministry, which we'll share about in just a few moments. But uh, it's just a joy to be partners with her. We've been together now uh, 36 years, and it has been a wonderful, wonderful life of serving the Lord and reaching the lost together. So I'm so grateful to have her with me this morning. And we have two sons, Alec and Andrew. Um, they're grown now, 29 and 26, but uh, when they were growing up, we, we often called them uh, nitro and glycerin. Um, it was their boundless energy, and uh, they, were, they were quite the pair to raise. And, uh, and that boundless energy had needed a boundless supply of food and fuel. You know, we, we tried to set up a college fund for them, and, and they ate that up. Uh, we tried to set up a retirement fund. They ate that up, you know. But uh, we, we uh, at one point, we were looking for a bumper sticker we could put on the car. Just said, honk if you have groceries. I mean, we, it felt like feeding the multitudes with those two boys, I tell you. But uh, they love the Lord. They're serving the Lord and in ministry. And so we're so grateful. But, you know, that's really what we're here to do is to feed the multitudes. 
There are multitudes out there. And we know the story very, very well. The only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels is the feeding of the multitudes. And it wasn't just, it was 5,000 men. But the total of the crowd was more like fifteen to 20,000 people that were there. They didn't even count the women and children. And so by all accounts, it was at least 15,000, if not 20,000 people late in the day that Jesus and his disciples had to feed. And how many know that's the kind of numbers we're looking at? Not thousands. We're not even looking at millions. We are looking at billions that are still waiting to taste the bread of life one time. In fact, that story, that miracle Jesus did, many people missed the whole point of that. It was not about feeding the crowd. That wasn't the point. Those people were, it was one meal. Jesus cared. He wanted them to have a meal. They weren't going to starve to death to miss a meal. That wasn't the point. He did that miracle for the disciples. He said, watch me what we are going to do. You and I are going to do here. He said, you feed them. And they're like, how, how can we do this? The sun's going down. We got 15. He said, I'll supply. You serve. I'll supply. You share it and distribute it. And he was saying, he went on to say, I'm the bread of life. Okay. He was saying, this is how you and I are going to feed the world with the bread of life. Me. You bring me what you've got. You bring me that little lunch that that boy has and watch me multiply it and then you distribute it around this world. Friends, we're feeding the multitudes, amen? That's, and all we have to do is just bring our lunch. What it, and he knows what each of us has. He's given each of us different resources, not just financially, but our time, our talents, our training. But he says, just bring me what you've got and I will multiply it. Friends, that's all we got to do, amen? And then we share it and serve it around the world. And how many know that we're doing it today? It's late in the day. Just as Jesus was, and the disciples had to feed that multitude late in the day. How many know it's late in the day in this world? How many know darkness is falling? How many know the time is short? Are you with me? The sun is setting, folks. And yet there are still three billion people in this world that have never once, once heard who Jesus is and what he's done for them. They've never once heard that their creator became their savior. They've never heard. How can they call on the name unless they've heard? And they are just waiting for us to bring the bread of life. You see these boxes here? They're like the little lunches. And I loved how Pastor shared. This isn't just about giving them stuff. It's about giving it in the name of Jesus so that they know he loves them, that their creator came. And this is the taste of the bread of life that he wants us to distribute around the world. It's late in the day. And we, we could talk for an hour or two just on all the things that are lining up in the world showing how darkness is falling, the signs that are there. And we see culture is crumbling and creation is crumbling and even Christian protection is crumbling. Friends, did you know that every five minutes a brother or sister in the Lord is murdered and martyred in this world? Every five minutes. It's greater persecution now than at any time in history. Far more than the New Testament time under the Romans. Friends, that's the hour we're living in. But friends, our darkest hour is our finest hour. When it, the darkness is falling, it is a glorious darkness to us because we know how many know the darker it is, the sooner the dawn is coming. But in that dark hour, there is a light that shines brighter than ever to bring in that harvest of our lost brothers and sisters like Satan has his day. But God has his hour. And this is God's hour. Are you with me? This is God's hour. And we could go on and on talking about that. Just the assemblies of God. Just the assemblies of God. Some of you may or may not realize that this, this church actually is a missionary fellowship. It started a little over 100 years ago with about 300 outcasts who got the Spirit's power and, and spoke in tongues, and they got the right hand of disfellowship out of their mainline denominations, kicked out, and they came together in Hot Springs, Arkansas, 
300 people. And they had the unbelievable faith, if not audacity, to say, we 300 people are committing ourselves to the greatest evangelism the world has ever seen. Now, folks, that's cocky. That's, that's audacious to say, we 300 people are going to... Because their faith wasn't in them. They knew it was the Spirit's power that had come to send them out. And friends, we have gone from 300 people to now almost 70 million assemblies of God, brothers and sisters, around the world. How many are grateful to be part of a fellowship, a missionary movement that has gone around? It is an army. And friends, you know where that army came from? Right here. All those missionaries came out of churches right like this that were called in missionary services, that were called and then sent by people like you. You have sent an army around this world. Almost 70 million. The largest Protestant denomination in the world. We don't say that in praise to ourselves. We say, this is God's hour. The, the, just the country of Tanzania, where I was born in East Africa. My parents were missionaries there in, in the 50s. And uh, I was born right at the end of their time. My dad almost died. Uh, he had literally worked himself almost to death. He almost died of a, of a bleeding ulcer. He ended up losing like 90% of his stomach. Almost didn't make the trip home. But my parents were there. They were the main founders of the Assemblies of God in Tanzania. And when we had to leave there, they, they founded a Bible school there now that is a huge Bible school. Thousands have been trained and gone into ministry through that Bible school. They planted about 50 churches. They were there just seven years, but God did amazing things. But they could not have dreamed what God is doing today and just in Tanzania. Friends, today, the Assemblies of God of Tanzania, in the last 10 years, now I want you to listen to this. In 10 years, the Assemblies of God has planted just under 10,000 new churches in 10 years. Now, if that doesn't thrill you, your thriller's busted. I'm telling you, friends, this is God's hour. And when we left Africa, I was a baby in my mother's arms. They had asked a, a brother, a Sangawisi, to dedicate me as a baby to the Lord. I was the first white baby they'd ever seen, and so it was a, a really a big deal. And they, they were so grateful and honored that mom and dad asked uh, brother, a Sangawisi, uh, one of their brothers, to dedicate me as a baby. In fact, I still have a photo of, of him dedicating me, and there's just a crowd of African brothers and sisters standing around, and he's holding up this, this little white baby. And Anyone ever see The, the Lion King? Okay, it, it wouldn't have that picture coming to mind. All right, you know, Simba, Simba. Well, the day we had to leave, we were at the airport in Mbeya, Tanzania. It was actually Tanganyika then. And I was in my mother's arms. My dad was dying. He was on a stretcher. And the crowd of African brothers and sisters were there at the airport behind the fence. And as we were getting ready to board the plane on the, on the runway, on the tarmac, Brother Sangawisie, who my dad had a very special relationship with and had mentored and discipled. He could not contain himself. And he climbed that fence. And he ran across that tarmac. And he reached down to my dad. And he wrapped his arms around him, sobbing and weeping. And he said, Nikukugana, Nikukugana. Watuwariyumbumi kumyangu. He said, I love you. I love you. Because you brought me life. And friends, that's what we're doing. We're bringing the bread of life. He who has the Son has life, but he who does not has the, has the Son does not have life. How many know we are here to multiply the bread of life and just bring what you've got? Just bring that little lunch, and you won't believe how God will multiply it. This is God's hour, folks. This is God's hour. And how many know these, the, the kingdom of God is bigger than the assemblies of God, folks? Kingdom of God's a big place. Just in China alone, folks, every day in China, just that one country, between 30 to 40,000 people come to Jesus every single day in China. Friends, this is the hour we're living in. And the persecution is getting greater now. This new uh, premier or president is bringing it now re-education camps of up to 100,000 people. They call it re-education camps. They're rounding up Christians now in China. Friends, how many know you can't stop? The church. Persecution comes, the church explodes all the more. 
This is God's hour. It may seem dark, but it is bright. It's our finest hour because the greatest harvest is happening right now. How many want to be a part of it? Not just watch it, but to be our part, to bring our lunch, whatever that is. God is doing things we've never seen before. Well, we, years ago, we've just, throughout our lives, just tried to bring our lunch, whatever we had to, to give, whatever we had to offer as missionaries. We were in Indonesia, which is, some Americans don't realize, it is the largest Muslim country in the world. And it is now, it is the fourth largest country in the world. 266 million people in 17,000 islands, covering the size of the United States. That's how big Indonesia is. 3,200 miles across. 800 different languages, but there is one national language. Okay, but God is doing things there. We were there in 91 to 95. The island of Java, just to give you an idea, the island of Java, which is not the largest but the most populated island, just that one island has over 140 million people on that one island, the size of the state of North Carolina. Imagine almost half the United States in the state of North Carolina. That's the population of that one island. How many know every one? Those aren't just numbers. Every one of those numbers has a name, was a child of God. He created in his image, and they're just waiting to taste the bread of life. They're just waiting to hear the way home to him. Amen? And he is finding ways to multiply it to them. Well, we were there for four years. We, we learned the language. You really can't function in English there, except maybe in the capital city of Jakarta. Um, Jakarta now is the second largest city in the world. 31 million people in that one city okay um, more people than in all of Australia and a lot of countries just in that one city it's exploding and yet God is finding ways to multiply his message to them we got a letter from the government in 95 and they said you will not be allowed to return and it was so hard to understand. God had blessed our first term there. We had a lot of fruit. We had favor with our national brothers and sisters. We had learned the language. All of my preaching, all of my teaching of theology in the Bible school was all in Indonesian. We had to become completely fluent, not just conversational, you know, like how to ask where the bathroom is. We had to teach theology in Indonesian. And so we'd done all of that, and we were ready to come back for our second term to hit the ground running. And then we get a letter from the government, this Muslim-dominated government, saying you cannot return. You ever at times wonder, you know, what is God up to? Why, why would he allow this to happen? But how many know God, <laughs> he knows the end from the beginning. He's not up there like, oh, my goodness, what? i got to find somewhere for Jan and Iris now. I don't know what to do with these. No. When a door closes, he's got one over here waiting that's open. Amen? Long story short, we were back on furlough. We were on an itineration based in Springfield, Missouri, where I grew up. And, and um, I was putting uh, nitro and glycerin down to bed. And that always took a little while. And uh, finally, they went to sleep. I was laying there in the dark in between them. And we were going to be going to Fiji to work in the Bible school there. I was going to be academic dean. But and some other ministry, but I knew there was something else. I just sensed that God wanted us to do there, and I didn't know what it was, and I was laying there. And I'm not a guy that gets, you know, heavy revies all the time, what I call heavy revies. I don't have dreams and hear audible voices. You know, God speaks to me, amen? Aren't you glad God speaks to each of us in his own way? We each have our own, and it's just as real, it's just as true. But this night was very special, and he just dropped in my heart one word. And it was out of the blue. I didn't understand it, but it was the word radio. I had never done radio. I wasn't interested in radio. I didn't believe in media ministry. It was like Peter, you know, Peter had to have the sheet dropped with the unclean, you know, animals to say, this is what I want you to do. I want you to reach the Gentiles. And that was that way for me. It was like, and God's, how many know God's in charge of our life? And so you sign that blank check. He will fill in that blank check for you. It's up to him. And so I said, you know, I don't understand this God, but, but I sensed, I felt like it was real. But how many know only time tells? How many know not everything someone says God told them, God told them? You with me? It was, it was bad pizza sometimes. I'm just telling you. You learn you have to test the spirits, and, and, and Pastor Jimmy will tell you that. So I'd grown up in Pentecost. I knew that. So I thought, well, if it's God, it will happen. And the week we arrived in Fiji, the week we arrived, 
I was asked to do a radio program. Never done one. Long story short, I started the program. The Lord blessed. The audience grew very rapidly. And then another night, we were in Fiji. I was putting the boys down to bed again. I don't know what it was. That just got me close to God, trying to put them to sleep or something. And God showed me what he wanted us to do in all of the Pacific region through that. And so now today, and it's gone way beyond radio. We're on, it's, it's on TV. It's, it, local churches around the world use it. But um, we are now on every continent every day, 38 countries, 18 languages that God is using this ministry and our messages from, from, like I said, radio, TV. And what I need to explain is we are not on Christian stations, okay? We don't want to be on Christian stations, all right? Now, praise God for Christian stations, amen? I listen to them because I'm a Christian. But God said, I want you to go where the lost listen. I want you on the secular stations. So in between Bruno Mars and Taylor Swift, they're getting Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus said, I came for the sick. Nowhere does the Bible, does God's word say, tell the world to go to church. It commands the church to go to the world. Amen? And become friends of sinners. And so we are on leading secular stations in prime time. In some countries, we are on up to 10 times a day on secular stations. And we don't pay for airtime anywhere in the world. And we present Christ in every program. Friends, that's God. That's God. Why? It's not us. Listen, man, we're not even that good. But it's God's hour. Satan has his day. This is God's hour. Our darkest hour is our finest hour. It's harvest time, folks. And he's giving opportunities and tools that the church has never had before. And so now it's, it's being used. But everything we do is through local churches, trying to help the local church reach the multitudes that they could be reaching. There are opportunities just sitting there like silver platters for them, and they don't realize what's available to them in these, in these countries. Most of these countries, radio has a much larger audience than television. And so when you get on a station, you have the ear of the nation. There's usually just one or two major stations. But now it's gone on into newspapers, and we're, we're on the ground. We're on the air. We're, we're online. God is multiplying his message. And there are so many testimonies we could share. It won't take long, but we, we got, um, well, just the, my wife's home country. She's from the South Pacific originally. And God opened doors for us to, to start there. And we opened uh, our program there on the leading secular station called Magic FM. Three quarters of the country listened to that one station. It became the, the number one program in two weeks. And then God opened doors, and people began to respond. There was a young man there that worked at the station, very well known in the country. He was the, probably the highest profile homosexual in the country. His name was, we'll just say his name was Tevita, which is, is David in Psalm 1. He listened to our program every day. And after five months, not just hearing my voice, but the Holy Spirit's voice. I mean, you know, the, the Spirit speaks to their heart. But they have to hear the word. They have to hear the message. That's how the Spirit speaks. After five months of listening every day, Monday through Friday, the Holy Spirit completely set him free, transformed him. He has now been married with three children serving the Lord for almost 20 years now. Friends, the power, it's beside... It doesn't matter whether it's coming from a pulpit in a church or through a radio. The power is in the truth. The power is in the gospel. The power is in the message. And they have to get the message one way or another. Amen? We have to multiply that message, the bread of life. The minister of trade and commerce was on a plane with Iris a few years ago. One of the cabinet ministers of the country. And he knew. Very few people know we are behind think a minute everywhere we are it's about making jesus and the local church famous in that country and so they've never heard of jan and iris Hurst. that's the way it's supposed to be we're not here to make us famous we're here to make jesus and the church famous amen but he knew about iris and i were behind it and he said he got out of his seat on the plane and he he just said i want you to know the impact that you have had on our country for the last 15 years, you have impacted our nation daily. The, the, the platform that God gives to the church in this hour is just amazing. Well, how many know it doesn't matter what our place is? Every one of us has a lunch to bring. You know, 
that, that little boy in that miracle, I don't know if you ever realized that, but that boy that brought that lunch, he wasn't, he was a nobody. He wasn't even counted as part of the crowd. He wasn't even in the number that was counted in the crowd. And yet he was the one Jesus chose to be the partner in the miracle. How many know there are people, maybe even here this morning, you feel like a nobody. You feel like you're not counting. You're not a missionary. You're not a ra- whatever. And Jesus is saying, I want you to be my partner in this miracle. Just bring me your lunch, whatever that is. That's what this missions convention is about. And I'm going to multiply it. That boy brought that lunch. And friends, it wasn't even hardly a lunch. It was a snack. You realize those fish, these weren't two big, beautiful fish, you know, on the Pacific. We, we love mahi-mahi and ahi and, I mean, beautiful fish and, and, and all that. No, these were two pickled fish like sardines. He had a couple of sardines and basically some crackers. Jesus didn't need that lunch. How many know Jesus was the creator who made everything from nothing? But he's saying, I want you to be part of this. Bring me what you've got. And then together, we're going to feed this world. And so you bring it. And he's just saying, whatever your lunch is, bring me your sardines and crackers. Now, he knows each of us, whatever it is, but just bring it and watch me multiply it around this world. You know, God is still, God uses children, doesn't he? Can I tell you very briefly, so how many here have heard of, of the largest church in the world in, in Korea? Uh, Pastor Cho pastors the church. And, and it's for many years now, the church has been about 800,000 people for many years now. And Pastor Cho was a very, very dear family friend, a very f- good friend of my dad. When my dad died over 30 years ago, he, he flew from Korea to be in the funeral and to speak and everything. And he stayed in our home for a couple of days. I grew up with him kind of uh, friends with dad and in our home at different times. And, and, and he's a wonderful guy, great sense of humor, tells great stories. But during that time in the home, he told, many people don't know how he came to the Lord, but he was a Buddhist monk dying of tuberculosis. He was just like 20 years old. And he was, every day he was dying and he was just spitting up blood in a bucket. And he was angry. He was bitter toward God. And one day a knock came on the door. He opened the door. It was a young girl. She was about 11, 12 years old. And she had a New Testament she wanted to give him. And it made him angry. He yelled at her, slammed the door in her face. Well, next day came. She was back. Knock. He opens the door. There she is again. This time he even, I don't know, he he may have even cursed her, but he just yelled all the more, slammed the door in her face. Third day, third time's a charm, right? Well, it was. He started to slam the door in her face. And before he could, she said, please, 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 wait, wait, no, no, please. Just take it, just take it. I promise I'll never come back. Just take it, please. So he grabs it out of her hand, slams the door. Later, after he cooled down, he sat down, he saw it over there. He picked it up. How many know the same Holy Spirit that inspired that word and framed that world and framed this world is there when the word comes alive and he makes Jesus real and he began to read in Matthew and Jesus became real to that dying monk, healed him instantly of tuberculosis, transformed him. He was called into ministry, went to an Assemblies of God Bible school, then went on to start, plant, and build the largest church in history. And he said, when I get to heaven, after I see Jesus. You see that girl, she kept her promise. She never came back. And he said, I am going to look for that girl. And she's going to be a woman now. And I'm going to find her. And I'm going to thank her for coming again, for not giving up, for the courage she showed And I'm going to say, sister, I want you to look now at all the people that have come to Jesus and in his family through my ministry. And I want you to see there is your reward also. Friends, that's what God's going to say to you. For every dollar you've given, for every prayer you've prayed. Friends, if we just bring him our lunch, whatever we have, he will multiply it pastor friend of mine in Australia, 
he told me about a boy in his church. His children's church is amazing. It's an amazing missions church. But he, he said, their children's church. Now listen to this. It's not a huge church. It's a church of maybe four or five hundred. Good sized church, but not a mega church. Just their children's church. Last year, gave $90,000 to missions. Just the children's church. And the parents are not allowed to give toward that. The kids, they're not, you know, getting it from mommy and daddy. The kids raise it all. Okay, this isn't the youth group. This is the children's church. There's a boy named Jackson. Several years ago, he filled out his missions pledge. And the pastor um, was going through the missions pledges. He asked to figure the budget for the year and get an idea. And he saw his name, Jackson. He was seven years old. And Jackson pledged $7,000 for missions that year. Basically, 600 bucks a month. And pastor's like, oh, he knows Jackson. His parents are Christian school teachers, so they don't make a lot of money. But, but he said, well, I got to set this aside. You know, there's no way Jackson's going to give 7000 We can't figure this as part of the budget. Well, Jackson was serious. And so he told his mom and dad, he said, for birthday and Christmas, I don't want, I don't want anything. I just want cash. Just give me cash. But it's not for toys. No, it's for my missions pledge. And then he began, he had his mom teach him how to make uh, cupcakes and cookies and bake. And he started making cookies, and he started selling them all over the place. In the church lobby, in his neighborhood, he made homemade Christmas cards. And by the end of the year, you guessed it, that seven-year-old boy, he was now eight, by the end of the year, he gave $7,000 to missions, 600 bucks a month from a seven-year-old who didn't have a job, but he had a mission. And he had a heart for Jesus' mission. No, I'm not saying we're going to, you know, I'm just saying it's amazing what we can do when the love of Jesus and the passion of Jesus, amen? We just bring what we've got, and man, he will multiply it. And that's what we're doing here this weekend. We, I didn't share with you one of the places that our, our message and program has been used, and as we're going back to Indonesia now, the largest Muslim country and God has opened doors. We're going to continue our global ministry. We're going to be in Jakarta, which I mentioned, the large capital city. So we'll be doing global ministry, but we'll also be doing local ministry. We'll be doing pastoring. We'll be doing leadership training. And God is just opening doors. Friends, the persecution is greater, but the church in Indonesia is advancing like never before. More Muslims are coming to the Lord than ever before. Many believe God is starting a wave, a tsunami of revival and harvest from Indonesia that's moving back toward the Middle East. I'm just telling you, this is an amazing hour that we're living in. And so thank you. Thank you, Pastor Jimmy, and for you that are sending us back to this place to, to multiply and maximize this hour that we have. Because we don't know how long it is. But God is multiplying like we've never seen before. And so we do this in a lot of countries. But one of the countries where our message, our program is used is in Sri Lanka. And the pastor there, he was also the general superintendent, Deshaun Wickramaratne. He used our program for our messages for about eight years. And he was on the radio on five stations three times a day, reaching two million people a day. And he became famous in his country. Through, the name of our program is Think a Minute, okay? Now, it's, it's longer than a minute, but, you know, Think Several Minutes doesn't quite have the same ring. So we went with Think a Minute. That was, that was uh, my wife Iris's idea name. And so, so he is Mr. Think a Minute in Sri Lanka and Colombo. And then they also have 100,000 people a day getting it on their cell phones as downloads. Friends, the tools and opportunities we've got to maximize the message in this hour. Well, his church has become, people's church has become so known through, throughout the country and the city because of Think a Minute. He told me about a man in his church and he had quite a story he uh, he was a preacher's kid and he grew up his parents were very poor as preachers pastors they were persecuted they had next to nothing and by the time this young man was 16 years old he was so bitter toward God he turned his back on God he said if that's what Jesus does for you if that's what Jesus does when you serve the Lord my parents are poor they're persecuted I want nothing to do with Jesus. Okay? So he, he ran from God. He rebelled. He literally, it was a prodigal son story. He stole money. He ran and went to Colombo, the capital city. He lived wild for about six months till the money ran out. 
And at the end, he was out of, of reason to keep going. And so he was going to commit suicide. And he went and bought the poison. In many of these third world countries and poor, that's a very common way that they kill themselves is they get rat poison or something and they drink it. And it's an it's a excruciating way to die. But that's the only thing they can afford. And so he went to the botanical gardens in Colombo, Sri Lanka. And he went to an obscure kind of private little part of the garden. And as he tipped his head back, he put all the way back so the, the poison would go straight down to his, so it wouldn't get on the sides of his mouth and burn, so he could pour it straight down into his, into his gullet, into his stomach. And as he leaned back, he looked up, and here is this big banner in this weird, you know, private part of the garden. Big banner, if you need hope, Jesus is your answer. Come to the YMCA today at 5 o'clock. And he's like, what is that doing here? And it made him mad. <laughs> he said, Jesus won't even let me kill myself. He was so mad. And he said, I can put off, I can put off killing myself for a day. So he says, I'm going to go to that meeting. And I am going to ruin that meeting. I'm going to heckle the preacher. I'm going to hassle him. And he did. He went to the meeting. He was calling out, disrupting. And... The, the preacher was very gracious and patient. And he said, son, please, please, just wait. He said, I'll talk to you afterwards. Went to the end of the service. Had the altar call. People came down. This young man came down. He came down angry. He wanted to talk to this preacher. But he came down angry. And he left totally changed. He was the last one in the altar that night. Gloriously saved. His heart set free from all the anger and bitterness surrendered to Jesus. He was called into ministry, went to the Bible school in Colombo, Sri Lanka. After a year in Bible school, his father died. And so he ran out of money. He ran out of his resources to finish school. So he was leaving Bible school. Well, the day he was walking off the campus, the principal of the Bible school saw him and he called out. And he said, wait, 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 come, come, come here. Don't go. And so he, he thought, you know, maybe I'm in trouble. I don't know, you know. He brings him into his office, the principal, the president of the Bible school. And he said, here, this just came for you today. And it was an envelope. And he handed it to him. And as he grabbed it, he could feel there was, there was money inside. And it was from a woman in Panama City, Florida. And she was a widow, a poor widow. She supported herself by mowing lawns. And she was praying one day, and the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, there's a young man. Now, this in those days, the country was called Ceylon before it became Sri Lanka. In a country called Ceylon, there's a young man that needs to finish Bible school. I want you to support him. She didn't have any. She looked on a map. She couldn't find Ceylon. So finally, she wrote to the national headquarters. Somebody's got national headquarters in Springfield and sent the money and said, can you, is there a country called Ceylon? And is there a Bible school there? And if so, could you send this to help a student finish? They forwarded it on. And the day he was leaving the campus, that arrived. She supported that young Bible school boy for the next two, two and a half years. There, she was a poor widow. There, were month, there was one time he, he said that, that the roof was leaking over her bedroom. In her, she, instead of using the money to fix her ceiling, she moved her bed into the living room so she could sleep there and save the money from fixing the ceiling to keep supporting that boy. She cut back on her eggs and her meat and everything so she could make sure he finished Bible school. He finished Bible school. And he went on to start the first Assemblies of God church in Ceylon, or now Sri Lanka. He became the first general superintendent of the Assemblies of God of Sri Lanka. Pastored and built the largest church, Assemblies of God Church in Sri Lanka. You see, he is the father of Pastor Deshan Wickramaratne, Pastor Colton Wickramaratne, who then impacted all over Asia, hundreds if not thousands of men are in the ministry because of his ministry. His son has led that church even to greater heights, like I said, reaching millions of people. In fact, just last week, Brother Colton Wickramarotney went home to be with Jesus. But friends, I want you to think, what would have happened if that woman in Florida had not heard from God and just brought her lunch, and it was a little lunch, 
and God multiplied it. Do you realize the people that are in the kingdom forever in God's family? Friends, all we do is bring it and he will multiply it. And right now, if you would just bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment before pastor returns. You know, we're here today and God has brought us, given to each of us something that we can bring to him to be multiplied. Doesn't matter what it is. The number one thing, and I'm sure Pastor Jimmy would, would resonate with this. Number one thing is that each of us, whatever it is, we just make a commitment to make a commitment. Every one of us can do something. What would be beautiful if 100% of the church family here was doing whatever God wanted them to do, whatever it is, small or great, whatever that lunch is, to reach our lost brothers and sisters in this hour that is dark, the sun is setting. And today you would just say, Brother Jan, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. But you would just slip up your hand. We're not going to bring you forward or anything like that. But you just sense and know God has people he wants you to reach. And all you have to do is just obey and be his partner in multiplying the bread of life around the world. Through your time, through your training, through your talents, and through your, your treasures, your resources. But whatever that is. And you would just slip up your hand, put it right back down. You say, yes, Jan. I am excited about this hour. I just want to do my part, whatever it is. And it's totally between you and God. I have no idea. It's none of my business. But each of us gets to play a part in that. Yes, yes, yes. Anyone else, just slip up your hand. It's just between you and the Lord. But today we just make a commitment to make a commitment. As pastor comes, Father, we pray right now. As we pray about these faith promise pledges and we, we figure out what it is that's in our lunch that we can bring. What we can give and live with what we can give and maybe even live without. Maybe we can cut back on the Starbucks. Maybe we can come back. It doesn't matter whatever it is. It's, you will speak to each of us whatever we can do. And we, what we can give and even live by faith. But today, you are going to bless your people as they are a blessing to this world and to your lost children in this short, dark hour that is also our finest hour of harvest, Lord. Bless them now. Multiply this church's outreach locally and globally in the name of Jesus before you come back in Jesus' mighty and merciful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Listen, I want to just share some things. And see, as, as, as our brother was sharing, there's so many things that God is dropping into my heart, and I promise not to preach another sermon, but boy, I want to right now. But I won't. Um, but I was thinking to myself, you know, a missionary comes in, and I'm just being, I'm just being realistic with you. A missionary comes in, and people go, "Oh, it's a missionary." God forgive us. I remember thinking that way. I'd be in Bible school, or I'd be in church, and my favorite preacher, or my favorite missionary, or or rather, my favorite professor, you know, was going to preach or was going to speak, and I just couldn't wait to hear him. And then they would announce, we have missionaries so-and-so from wherever. And I'd go, oh. You could hear it. All across the auditorium, you could go, you'd hear this, oh. What a shame. What a shame. What have we missed? Honestly, I love statistics because I love to hear what God is doing. Also, this is not, this is relevant to every age in this room. Can I just share something with you? Folks, from the youngest person in this room, life is not all about Fortnite. And I'm looking at you, kids under whatever. I'm telling you. I'm being, I'm being straight with you. You're going to get to an age in your life, kids, because I have kids. You're going to look back and go, boy, that was stupid. Let me go up from there. Life is not all about, let's talk to millennials. Life is not all about your rights and privileges. Not at all. Not if, not if we're serving Jesus. Let me go up from there. Life is not all about our 401k. It's not. It's just not. We're so accustomed. We're so, we're so ready to think about ourselves. And, and when a missionary comes in and I hear that, it really does. It ramps me up. It does. It makes me think, if a missionary... If an American missionary had never come to Sicily, would, where would my family be? 
Where would my mom and dad and, and grandparents and all of my family, everyone, if an American missionary hadn't showed up in Sicily, where would I be? So this is very close to home. Very close to home. Folks, I know that last year many of you filled out these faith promise cards. And I want to challenge you today. Let me be clear about this. Let me be clear about this. Our faith promise, our, our, faith, our promise to support missions does not come out of our tithe. Our 10%, our first fruits, our first and our best goes to the Lord, absolutely. But then beyond that, have we not learned even this year, the more we give, the more we get. And we don't give for that purpose. We don't give for that reason. That's not the end goal. But you cannot outgive God. You simply cannot. If this doesn't stir you up, your stirrer is broken. I'll say it's slightly different than you did. Your thriller, your stirrer, whatever it is, work, whatever. If this doesn't move you, if it's all about, if it's all about central folk, it's all about your focus, it's all about you, it's all about you. Something's wrong. Something's broken. Listen, God put me on this earth to honor him. He did. He put me on this earth to, to honor him, to bring glory to him, and to multiply myself after I came to know Jesus. That's what I'm here for. I want to share a quick scripture with you. And the scripture is one you're familiar with, Acts chapter 13, verse 47, right? For this is what the Lord has commanded us. And you know Acts. You know the book of Acts. I, let me just, before we read that, I want to share this with you. You know I've only been here, it's not, I don't think it's five years yet. And I, it doesn't matter what's happened in years past, but when I got here, it was pretty bleak. The finances were bleak, the attendance was bleak, the whole thing was bleak. I was trying to figure out, God, why did you bring me here? I really was. For a season, I was trying to figure out, why am I here? And slowly but surely, God began to build things back up. And it was God. It wasn't me. It was God. I'm still trying to figure out what I'm doing in the pulpit. I'm still trying to figure out what in the world are you thinking? Fortunately, God is better at this than I am. But the truth is, the truth, <laughs> I know, uh, the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, I really do pinch myself and think, am I really doing this? Is this real? And I see what God does and I think, yeah, because God loves to use the little, the nothing, the bring your lunch. I love that. Did you catch that? I hope you caught his heart this morning. Bring your lunch, even if it is two sardines and some crackers. I would prefer anchovies, close enough. Listen, listen, the, what I'm challenging you for today is maybe your missions promise last year was a certain amount. And maybe you haven't been here long enough to have a faith missions promise. I want to grow it this year. I want to grow our missions I do. I want, I, want, I want the church to grow. I want souls to come in. I, I, I agree with you completely, brother. I, I really do. I, we're not advertising on Christian radio. What's the point? I'm not trying to get people from other churches. We want lost souls. We want them to come in here. We do. But there's lost souls all over the world. Not just here. Maybe you haven't even been here long enough to fill out a faith promise. And, and, and I just want to challenge you to do, do so if you've never done so. But if you, if you had uh, $30 a month last year or $50 a month last year or maybe it was just $10 a month last year, you know what? Can we step out in faith and can you prayerfully, prayerfully, I'm not a car salesman. I, I, I don't know where you are. I, I really don't. Uh, so can we prayerfully say, God, will you challenge me? Because those missions money go to support missionaries. They don't build the church. It doesn't get us new carpeting. It's not going to do the, uh, like it's not, it doesn't stay here. God is so good. Have we not known? I, I can't wait for the business meeting. <laughs> I can't. Have we not realized the more we give away, the more God blesses it? And I mean that not just financially. I mean of our energy, of our time, of our focus. It's not, it's not just about me. I'm so blessed. I really am. There are people all over this church that have given of their time and of their energy to bless the church, to bless me personally, that we've done work on the building. All, 
I, I, I look around, honestly, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I, I, it, it, Jim's with the sound stuff, like wiring that he had, all, all the, John Entrican's on the roof. I'm not trying to embarrass anything. Jerry's spending his time. Dave is doing electronics, electrician work all over the building. Guys, I got to tell you, you cannot outgive God. You can't. He will bless you, and he has. All right, let me go back to the scripture. Did I mention I wasn't going to preach right now? No, I'm, we're, we're going to wrap up. We're going to pray. We're going to wrap up. I just want to share this verse for you. Please let it hit home. Let it hit home. This is the reality of it, folks. I want to go home and watch football. Can I just be honest with you? I want to go home, eat lunch, put something comfortable on, sit on my couch, put my feet up, and watch football. That's what I want to do. God, <laughs> that's not wrong, wrong spot, right sentiment, wrong spot. <laughs> but I'm with you. I'm with you. Listen, the, the truth the truth is, that's not what God called me to. He didn't call me to a life of perfect comfort. He called me to give myself away, whatever way that is. Acts chapter 13, you know the book of Acts. You know what's happening. Jesus is gone. He's telling them what to do. They're all excited. The Spirit's... Okay, so just very quickly, we know that... So we know the... Verse 47, chapter 13, the book of Acts. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That's what today is about. That's what the missions convention is about. I love missions. I love missionaries. I've said this so many times. I don't know that I could pick up my family and yank us out of everything that we know and go live in a foreign country to give myself away like that. If God had called me, he's going to equip me. I know that. I get that. But it's tough, man. And I have nothing but respect for the people that can do that. You all know Brother Dave Hearn and Ernestine. Their heart beats missions. I love that. That's what we're called to. That's what we're here for. So before we dismiss you, can we just stand one last time? We're going to pray. But before we pray for the service, I'm going to ask if the Hursts will come up. Guys, will you just come up here, Brother Jan, Iris? Will you just, we want to pray. We're going to lay hands. We're going to just ask, I ask Pastor Ben if you'll come too. Uh, where's Elaine? Elaine and Frank, are you in the room? Guys, will you come? We just, I just, before we close the service and pray for our own missions here, um, we, we, we do want to pray, um, especially for this couple, and I pray that you remember them. I really do. Um, just close your eyes with us and pray with me. Father, we, we are so grateful. We are so grateful that there are people that you've called, oh God, to serve you all over the world, to give up their rights to give up their privilege to not think about to not think about personal things god we know that you're going to bless them we know that we're called to be wise stewards even of our own futures we're not saying that you've not called us to be paupers you you didn't but at the same time god i'm so thankful for their ministry and for their heart and for the message god we we are excited to hear what's happening overseas through the ministry through their even through their radio ministry god i ask that you would just pr I, we pray an anointing over the hearsts i pray protection over their family over them over their sons god i ask that your hand would be on them that you would expand their territory god we have been blessed by their experience We've been blessed by their, their experience and their maturity in ministry, and we thank you for that. And I just ask, God, that you would expand their territory, God, to honor you, to serve you, that many would come into a knowledge of Jesus Christ because of the efforts that they're giving. I pray for every area of their life. God, be it physical, spiritual, material, all of it. God, I ask that your hand would be on them. I pray you'd protect them from without and from within protect them from themselves protect them from the external i pray that you would drive them direct them open doors guide them they've been a blessing to us father we pray in jesus name by your holy spirit you would bless them exponentially in every way god and now we pray uh, god that you would give us a heart this morning to just be challenged to give in missions perhaps we're not ready with a number right now this morning but god i ask that you would stir us up will you Stir us up, God. I pray that we would not be so focused and so self-centered, God, that we forget that you've called us to be a light unto all the world. We love you. We pray a blessing over this meeting. We pray a blessing over this service. We worship you. We thank you. We honor you. 
and we we just pray in Jesus name that you would uh, allow your sweet presence to continue uh, to to abide here with us that we would stay in your presence this is your church this is your agenda it's all about what Jesus what you've called us to do we ask that you would help us to be obedient in doing just that we pray this in Jesus name amen